For me, that is the way to go. Most people in the vanadium space really need to be getting into the batteries. Hello and a warm welcome to viewers tuning into the assay. We're getting some very timely insights into the vanadium market in this session. And I'm delighted to introduce Christopher Eccleston, who is principal and mining strategist at Halgarten and Co. And Christopher has a broad career across mining, leading research teams and economic think tanks on the investment side, and also at equity research firms and sits on the board of several junior mining companies. So Christopher, welcome. Thanks for speaking with me today. Thanks. Um, so vanadium, uh, it's a really interesting time to be talking about the vanadium market. Let's talk about the price uh, to start with. Um, it seems like uh, there's been plenty of spikes and, and then plunges uh, throughout the years. Um, is vanadium really that volatile? Um, yes. Um, but is it? Um, that's an interesting question because um, there, there's been a reason for each spike um, or ramp, as one might put it. And then uh, as soon as the ramp's over, um, you know, history now shows that if vanadium ramps, it is going to dump uh, almost immediately that it hits its high. Uh, there's no sort of like long ramp up and then long ramp down. It goes up and then down. Um, so it's just a case if you're a vanadium watcher, of just uh, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a rough ride. Um, it's a bit like a roller coaster. And then when it comes down, there are multiple years in which it just flatlines before it does this thing again. Um, and so uh, it's interesting because if you look at um, one of the major usages, which is um, one of the major rising usage, which is vanadium uh, redox batteries, mm -hmm. people in that space will claim that uh, prices over $10 a pound are deal killers. Um, if, so if the price spikes at 30, which was the, the last time it went up, everyone was sort of basically saying, we're out of this, we're shutting down, um, we're unviable, it was over 10, obviously. Um, and then lo and behold, two months later, it was back down under 10. And um, so my advice is don't give up your day job if uh, you see the vanadium price spike because um, it will come back to earth. Uh, I'm actually quite surprised um, over the last year that the vanadium price has not got going a bit more. Um, you know, it fell back down, after the 30, it fell back down to like six, seven, it's doodled around there. Now it's 880. Um, which compared to six is a, is a big move, but um, compared to the 30 is, is rather pathetic. Um, mm. And compared to the moves in other battery metals, vanadium has been um, sort of like uh, lying there like a dead fish on the dock um, and not able to get itself moving again, um, despite the um, excitement in, in battery metals. Mm. So we'll come on to that a little bit in a bit more detail, but what do you think is bringing the price back down to earth? Um, is reality. It sort of <laughs> reality or or... Um, which Over. is that um, the, the people in the, I don't know who the people who are who ramp it up. Maybe the hedge funds who you know, suddenly believe the story on VRBs, they've never heard of it before. And they say, well, this must mean that the price must go up. Mm. Or um, the perpetual rumour is, Chinese are going to up the proportion of vanadium that they use in steel alloys. Yeah. And that gets it going again. And then the Chinese come out and say, well, price has gone too high, so we're going to delay our rules on uh, increasing the um, percentage of um, vanadium in alloys. And lo and behold, it falls back down again. So I don't think the Chinese are ramping up because it's not in their interest. That they do ramp. They ramp rare earths. They ramp lithium, they ramp other things. But in, in the case of vanadium, it's not in their interest to ramp it because they are very dependent upon getting it from uh, other sources. So I just think if speculators get in there, they believe the story, uh, up it goes, they suddenly realise that there's no one behind them in the line ready to pay that price. Then the thing plunges and another generation of hedge funders <laughs> lose their shirts. And... Um, it takes, uh, you know, five or six years between ramps before a new generation of suckers appears who <laughs> think that they're going to do this again and lose their shirts again. Different yeah. group of suckers. I don't think anyone will come back to the vanadium at $30 scenario if they'd done it before. 
Mm. Um, certainly there are people on the sell side of Vanadium who will very gladly sell you Vanadium for $30 a pound. Yeah. But um, the buyers are a bit of a nebulous um, sort of like a once in a lifetime crew who get cleaned out and then go away. Yep. Interesting. Okay. So thinking about the energy storage and the energy transition and how that is a driver perhaps for vanadium redox flow batteries. Um, how do you see the demand picture stabilizing or increasing more consistently over this decade and perhaps smoothing out some of this peak trough cycle that you've seen? Um, and how, you know, how's the energy transition really changing the land, the picture for the vanadium market? Um, well, I'd say it's going well. Um, the, the one sort of fly in the ointment is that um, people keep claiming that you can do large format lithium ion batteries. Right. Um, certainly at the current moment where the lithium price is like into the stratosphere, um, no one would be realistically, even Elon Musk, um, claiming that um, it's worthwhile to use lithium ion batteries for large storage formats. And lithium ion batteries for large storage are just not suitable because one, um, you know, the, those batteries tend to be outdoors um, and lithium ion um, uh, it has this constant problem of spontaneous combustion. Now your cell phone um, is not likely to catch fire, but the bigger the format is, um, the bigger the chance of thermal runaway is and the lithium ion battery just goes kaboom and um, goes up in a ball of flames. Mm. So um, uh, it's, lithium ion has never been a good formula for a large formats. Um, and particularly with the price where it is, it's dead duck. Um, it's just not gonna work. So either lithium has to get a lot, lot cheaper or lithium ion batteries in, um, in, in you know, sizable um, you know, shipping container size which is what vanadium redox, you know, specialises in, mm. uh, is just a no-go. It's a non-star. Mm. And are there some other attributes of why the vanadium redox flow battery is better? You know, I've read about the degradation on the lithium-ion battery side, where yep. you have to replace the whole battery cell. Whereas yep. vanadium After eight years, there's cool. some of the vanadium redox battery size pointing. I mean, the, 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 and what's more, in the lithium-ion batteries, you sort of start to get this decline after like five years to the eighth year. And, the, you know, who, who, who wants that? That just doesn't make any sense. One of the arguments that the, uh, Elon Musk made was that he was going to take old um, EV batteries or uh, yeah. HEV batteries in the hybrids and then create little uh, sort of um, uh, server farms, well, not like server farms, but battery farms, um, where you hook all these uh, these old batteries together and you give them a life after death. Um, really, that was an idea as long as lithium-ion battery recycling was in its infancy. Mm -hmm. But now that um, everyone, every man and his dog and every government and his dog is talking about, yes, we need to recycle these after the eight years, um, why wouldn't we just take the lithium-ion battery, recycle it, rejazz it, and you get the... Um, to resell the lithium at a much higher price than um, than putting it in someone's garage in the power wall format that um, Elon was, was plugging um, when you can do um, other formats like um, like antimony molten salt, which is another large format storage, or um, VRBs. Interesting. And sodium batteries. People are talking about sodium now. Yes. Um, of course, you know, down the track, you know, hydrogen is big buzz, um, but uh, you know, hydrogen has not had its rubber hit the road yet. So um, that may be a pipe dream, but the other formats definitely there for bigger batteries um, that just don't have, the, don't have the hassles or the cost now of lithium ion. Yeah, certainly. It seems that the maturity in the battery market space is leading to you know, a, a, an array of chemistries for an array of uses. Um, as, as, this, as the market matures. Okay, well, let's switch to um, a significant part, well, the larger part of the vanadium market demand in steel production. You know, we talk yeah. about batteries a lot. It's very hot, it's definitely growing, um, but let's not forget the steel production um, outlook. So um, could you give us an update there of how that that is impacting uh, vanadium? 
Well, you know, the constant rumor, yeah, the, the, the vanadium demand from the West for use in rebar, it, where it's used as an alloy to strengthen the steel, and it, it does have a massively strengthening effect. Um, there is another fact that we should mention, which is that potentially niobium um, uh, can be used as a replacement for vanadium in uh, these formats. So that's another thing that happens when um, the price of vanadium is close to 30 and the price of niobium doesn't necessarily move up. People jet then say, well, we're out of the vanadium into the niobium for the steel alloys. Mm. Um, niobium's, um, you know, got a pretty good supply situation. Most of it comes from Brazil. Um, but uh, it, it, it sort of lurks around vanadium and says, okay, you get too expensive, we're going to move into space. The, mm. the big um, argument for vanadium uh, upside in steel is that um, the Chinese for a long time uh, were just creating any old rebar and putting it into any old building. Mm -hmm. um, and then they had a series of earthquakes at the start of last decade um, and the argument was that the Chinese would up the percentage of rebar because you were having these sort of like uh, apartment blocks and office blocks which just sort of pancake in an earthquake because the rebar was um, was too brittle mm -hmm. um, because it didn't have the vanadium. And so the argument was they're going to hike it to 7% um, uh, in the alloy and um, then uh, the Chinese demand would be endless. Um, well, here we are. The Chinese um, you know, did... Um, uh, use more vanadium, uh, whether they got to 7% or not is the thing. The Chinese would fiddle with the price um, and sentiments by saying, well, we'll go to 5% instead of 7%, or you know we were going to demand 7% by the end of this year, but we'll make it the end of next year or the year after. And that was how they managed to deflate the last two of the, um, the vanadium spikes. Mm. Um, and while I'm not a, a great China fan, I think it's good on them because um, they weren't going to be suckered by, um, uh, by speculators. And um, <laughs> there'd be speculators around, but these speculators weren't in China. They, so um, <laughs> they could be sacrificed, and they were. Um, so um, the demand there is... It's okay. It's really tied pretty much to global construction activity. And after yeah. the Evergrande debacle in China, I was going to um, ask. Yeah, what, what is the outlook for um, mass building of um, sort of like non? You, you can use the rebar infrastructure, of course, and three ways bridges and stuff. Um, but the the uh, the apartment construction boom in China looks like it's heading for the buffers. Mm. Um, which doesn't mean that it's over because, you know, China's still trying to move massive people out of, out of shacks and, um, and lower quality buildings into higher quality, higher value, higher profit buildings. Yeah. But um, the Evergrande debacle and its effect on other players in, the, um, in the, the apartment building sector in China has to be a bit of a dampener on, um, you know, whatever, you know, dramatic curves people have on... Chinese consumption of, of construction steels. And I would say, yeah, you'd be lucky if it's not flat for the next two years. Right. Yep. Interesting. Um, so how do we look then at the vanadium market in terms of interesting mining companies? Um, and as an investor that might be interested in gaining exposure to vanadium, where are the interesting equities? Um, are there um, a host of projects out there? Um, is there a lot more coming online? Um, or is medium uh, still very niche? In well, yeah, this is the delectable challenge here, is that many of the people in the mining space, say 880 or 7 or 6 or whatever it gets down to at, the, at its lows, is not good enough to bring <laughs> up new projects online. And yet we have the people in the vanadium redox battery space saying if it's over 10, it's not interesting for them to actually use vanadium redox. Or it's not economic for them to do so. Um, so you've pretty much got the price then range bound between like 8 and 10 with most of the people saying it's not worth their while to mine it. And so, um, you know, if you do a little um, survey of the... Uh, the uh, um, the Australian companies that claim to be interested in vanadium, 
ASX listed. There's, there's a long list of them, but none of them are actually moving forward. And if anything, they're probably being repurposed to something else because um, the name projects, which tend to be um, of the uh, TIFEV category, which means that they have titanium in them, they have iron in them, iron is the biggest component in these deposits, and then the vanadium in the mix. Um, you need to really need all three of those metals. Um, so uh, there's no shortage of big iron ore mines. So it's not smaller vanadium uh, mines or vanadium TIFEV mines mm. um, just don't have the economics. Um, so it has to be bigger formats. And bigger formats require big capex. Mm. And the big capex is not forthcoming as long as the price is 8 8 It's as simple as that. Yeah. So um, on the last sort of spike, we had Bushveld, um, which is a London-listed um, South African miner of um, a, a TIFEV deposit. Mm. They actually have a second project, uh, well, which was originally their first project, um, which um, is still not in the production phase. Um, they have the wherewithal and the structure to do that because they're actually vertically integrated into a uh, with ESCOM, mm. surprisingly, the South African Power Authority, into actually doing the soup to nuts of um, FRBs, um, via FRBs, because what they want to do is they want to um, uh, mine it and then produce the batteries. And for me, that is the way to go. Most people in the vanadium space really need to be getting into the batteries so that if the price spikes of the vanadium, then uh, they can uh, they can supply themselves. Um, so that was a very interesting development there. But um, still, there, there's no there's nobody else really big out there in the, um, in the space who's uh, really developing a project to bring bring it on stream. So this actually could create a scenario that post say Ever Grande crisis getting out of the way, you know, demand starts to rise a bit on that front, and we get more substantial uptake of uh, vanadium redox batteries. Mm. Um, then we might see demand rising, and there is definitely not a pipeline of big projects that are being built. So we may end up with a typical thing that's happened in the lithium space is that you get a surge in demand, but not enough projects. Suddenly get a number of projects being brought you know, into action, but if you've got a delay of two or three years to bring them back to production. And so you end up with a shortage, and then you end up with a surplus, and then a shortage in the surplus, and um, uh, you don't necessarily get. I don't think. I don't think we're going to see a spike like the thirty dollar one again. Um, so we're more likely to see a sort of like a more gradual rise of an eighty minute sort of regularization. So it becomes um, sort of a hybrid between a, a specialty metal and a and a base metal. Um, because when it comes down to it, the, these big vanadium mines, um, most of which are in South Africa, um, are uh, a, a bit. Um, and so it looks like a DSO type of direct shipping or type story rather than um, something that's, um, that's got a, like a mm. dense value added chain that is around the mine and then you mine it, you process it, and then you turn it into vanadium pentoxide all, all there and you, you've got a product that you can send straight to a battery manufacturer. That's not really what's happening. A lot of it's sort of going to, um, uh, uh, to China um, because the Chinese are, um, are actually moving into um, very much larger scale uh, VRBs. So we've talked about the VRBs are like shipping container size. Yeah. The Chinese are doing big ones that associate with power plants. Mm. Um, and you went with multi, multi megawatt, um, indeed hundreds of megawatts um, worth of um, you know, uh, VRBs at one spot. Um, whereas uh, most people think the VRB as being something you might have in a um, for associated with an isolated um, uh, solar farm or a, a series of wind turbines, mm. um, or if you've got a mine out in Burkina Faso where you're relying totally on diesel and you've got lots of sunshine, you can uh, you know take it out as solar, store it in a VRB, use it during the night, that that type of format. Uh, but the Chinese are thinking way way bigger. And mm -hmm. using the VRBs for um, peak shaving, 
Um, and this is something that's been mentioned also in the state of South Australia, in, in Australia, where um, you actually store excess power that you get from solar, but on a mass scale into these um, batteries. And then you release it between uh, you know, 6 p.m. and 9 p.m., which is generally the um, sort of the evening peak of demand where you don't have the sun, mm. but um, you then have to switch over to gas fired or something like that. But if you can store it in, in mass VRBs, then you can release it into the grid, the, um, the power that you've, you've taken off solar farms during the day when most people don't want it. Yeah. So it's very much hand in hand with re renewables and driving efficiencies. Within yeah. And peak shaving. Um, peak shaving is the big potential usage, not, you know, not some mining but kind of Burkina Faso. Yeah. Um, somewhere isolated. It's, it's going to be, um, that, that's going to be the big new usage. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so uh, other than Bushveld Minerals, there's not really anyone massively of scale. Yeah. Yeah, there are the companies with vanadium in the name, but it's, yeah. a, it's the name or, only or, um, you know, more of a wing and a prayer. Yeah, but vanadium is quite abundant as far as I understand in terms of availability. It's just a matter of... Yeah, the, there are a lot, the lots industry. of projects around. Um, whether the projects are big enough, you know, South Africa has massive... Um, deposits of vanadium um so we don't really need to go to you know, some of these people will say oh i've got an exotic project in in um, greenland or something like that um, we don't really need to go off to exotic difficult locations to work um, the vanadium story at least not uh in the foreseeable future you know like the next 10 years there's enough lying around um or in existing mines that can just up their production if, that, if the price is good, um, which is not necessarily all that easy, but it does take... The problem with spikes and dumps, like we've seen, is that no one actually gets geared up during a, a two-month, three-month spike to actually increase production. And because they've seen it before, they don't believe it. Um, you know, we're veterans in the vanadium space and they're veterans in the vanadium space, but um, none of the people that own mines are, are, are dumb enough to actually, you know, race out and do a massive increase in production involving capex, just because the price goes to thirty dollars, twenty dollars, something like that. They want to see it sustained over a few years before they do that, and that just hasn't happened. It's been more sustained at under ten, ten dollars than um, than over twenty. Yep, certainly, excellent. Um, well, that's that's really insightful stuff, um, Christopher. I'd like to say thanks for speaking with us, ATV. It's great to have the overview of where we're at with the vanadium market. Great. Thank you.